Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I know you're expecting an Easter message. <clears throat> I don't do that. I don't do holidays and switch it up. We'll, we'll probably mention the resurrection simply because, I mean, that's our entire faith. As we get to chapter 15 and probably the next year or so, we're going to find that the resurrection is the, it's the groundwork for our entire faith, for everything we believe in. No resurrection, no Christianity. No resurrection, no Jesus, no God, man, no salvation, no anything. So we, we celebrate the resurrection every day because that's what we are. It's who we are. We are Christians. And Christians, as Christians, we are built in and on the resurrection. So I'm not going to do an Easter message. We're going to continue where we left off, which is 1 Corinthians chapter 5. So go ahead and turn with me there, please. Um, all right. Father, we thank you for being a God, for your faithfulness. We thank you for your goodness. I thank you that you are just so much better than I could ever hope to ask for, Lord. Thank you for being a good Father. Thank you for allowing us to be able to gather on this beautiful morning. Thank you for allowing us to be able to fellowship, Lord. Thank you for the beautiful people that have shown up. Thank you for the people that are watching online, Lord. We ask that your word would do the work in each of our hearts, Father, that you are sending it out to do. We ask, Lord, that we would be transformed, that we would be conformed into your image, that everything about us, Lord, you would cut away, that you would renew it and make it new, Lord, that we would be like you. Our words, our thoughts, our actions, everything would resemble you, Lord. As we get into your word, Lord, we ask that you would open our hearts to remove the things that we've allowed in and to put in the things that you're trying to install, instill, I should say. Thank you just so much for being who you are, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. So as you guys know, for the last several chapters, for the last several weeks, Paul has been talking about the, to the Corinthian church about servitude. He's been going off on them about service, service, service. He's talked over and over about service because where the Corinthian church lacked is service. They served themselves and themselves only. They only lifted up themselves. If you didn't conform to their image, you weren't, you weren't allowed in. If you didn't have the gifts, if you didn't have what they thought you needed to have in order to be what they would call a Christian, you were out. And they were divided into factions. We remember the factions. Some were so spiritual. They said, no, we only follow Apollos. Don't, don't you know who Apollos is? We'd call him Skip today. Others would say, no, 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 no. We follow Peter. Others would call that gone. Some say, no, 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 we follow Paul. You can call that me. And then some were so spiritual, they just said, no, no, Jesus. And they're all broken up into these little factions. And though that last group was right, because the only one we follow is Jesus, nobody else. Though they were right, they were wrong in the way they went about it. We don't divide the body of Christ. And he started going on and he started talking to them about your gifts aren't yours because you created them. They're not yours because you just searched deep within and pulled them out and you became this great Bible teacher or this great worship leader or this great pick whatever you want to be. He says, no, they were given to you by God. They are for God. That's it. They operate through God, through his spirit. And Paul has, since, I mean, since the first verse, Paul has been harping on that particular subject that what they have is nothing except by Christ. Apart from Christ, they're nothing. And over the last several weeks, Paul had been talking to them about their servitude. And we saw how they lacked in that service. Well, today it switches up just a little bit because now Paul's going to start digging into the meat of what was really going on in the Corinthian church. He's going to dig in to where they've really taken a strong turn, where they have been living in immorality They've allowed things into the church that should never be. And they're overlooking them. And they're overlooking them with a snottiness. With this attitude of, we are so... What's the word I'm looking for here? Um, we're so free in our liberalities that we're going to overlook sin. We are so tolerant. Don't even worry about that. And we're going to find today that there is a time when we don't allow sin, but we understand what's taking place. And there's a time where we nip it in the bud and it's an absolute no-no. You'll see what I mean when we get there. I know that almost sounds heretical, but it's not. Just let's get there. I'll never forget when I was, I want to say I was like 16 or 17. Maybe I was 18. I got my first credit card. Now, do you guys remember what that was like getting your first credit card? It's amazing. 
And it's amazing because you go buy stuff and then you don't have to pay. And I, you know, I was young and dumb and I didn't know any better. So I was swiping that card every place I got. And it was just the most incredible thing because the bill never came. Well, not yet. And you know I mean, it took a while to come, but I just, it was incredible. I always had gas. I was eating out all the time. I had whatever I wanted to buy. And then this little piece of mail came. I opened it up and all of a sudden there was a bill. And oh, what the heck is this? That's when I learned the hard truth about credit cards. They're stupid and stay away from them unless you have to. But the point was when you swipe that credit card, you get instant gratification. But the bill always comes. It always comes. Sometimes it feels like it's not coming. That's the Corinthian church. They're swiping that spiritual credit card. And look how God is blessing us. Look at our gifts. Look at how much we've flourished. But the, the, the payment's coming. And Paul is going to harp on them today about that very thing. He's going to talk about leaven in the church. Let's go on. If you, for those, those of you that just walked in, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. As I was telling these other guys, our Easter services are much different than other churches because we don't do a resurrection Easter message. We pick up where we left off. And I'm, I'm sure there's somewhere we, where we can mention the resurrection in here. In verse uh, 1 of chapter 5, Paul says, It is actually reported that there is immorality among you. He tells them there's immorality. Now that word, we're going to stop there for a moment because that's a very important word. It's the Greek word pornea. Now we should all know what that means just by the root of that, pornea, right? It's where we get the word pornography. Now in the Greek culture, in the ancient culture, Pornia was much different than the way we consider porn today. We think of porn as an image on a screen or a magazine or something of that nature. In Paul's day, pornia was any distorted idea of sexuality. Anything. So it wasn't just subjugated to this one thing. It was anything that was distorted to pervert what God had intended sexuality to be. Between a single man and a single woman that were married biologically male and female. Nowadays, we have to say those things that are biological male, biological female, that are married into the covenant of God. That's the only place where sex is condoned. That's it. Nowhere else. But he says, it is actually reported that there is immorality among you. An immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles. Now, this immorality was so bad, he says, unbelievers don't even do this. What are you doing, church? The unbelievers don't even act like this. What's going on with you guys? Remember how he started up the, the, the first chapter? He built them up and just exhorted them as brothers in the faith, as children of God, as faithful in the Lord. And he just went off for the first like nine verses, just edifying, exhorting. And then he started digging into them. This is where the dig gets deep. This is where the dig gets deep. He says, there's immorality among you that's not even named among unbelievers, among the Gentiles. It says that someone has his father's wife. Now, that is a very big no-no. Now, this, isn't, this wouldn't be this person's mother. This would be a stepmother. And he says, it's reported that you guys are allowing this in the church. You guys aren't doing anything about it. And some might say, well, what's the big deal? We're free in Christ. It's a very big deal. If we were to go to Leviticus chapter 18, verse 7 and 8, you don't have to turn there, but I'm going to read this. This is what God says about the subject. He says, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your father. That is the nakedness of your mother. She is your mother. You are not to uncover her nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife. It is your father's nakedness. It is a sacred and holy thing God is saying the nakedness of your father, of your mother. And if you go through that whole chapter, I mean, it goes way beyond that. Kids, daughters, grandchildren. I mean, it goes on to all kinds of things. Aunts, uncles. But that's even besides the point. The fact that adultery is taking place is as big of an issue as any. Which in our culture is such a sad thing because in the church today, the divorce rate among us is as high, if not higher, than that of the world. It's probably higher now for the simple fact that the world doesn't marry quite as much as they once did. You know, in, in, the world, in the world or the eyes of those who don't believe, they've kind of seen it as this, 
thing that's being negated as they go forward in life, like marriage isn't necessary. So many people that are, are unbelievers, they just don't get married. So I believe if the statistics are right, actually today the divorce rate is higher in the church because of that. How sad is that? How sad is that? I'm going to tell you why divorce happens. I'm going to tell you why sexual immorality happens. I'm going to tell you why sin happens. Sin is the result of a lack of the fear of the Lord. Anybody wish to challenge me on that? Sin takes place because one lacks the fear of God in them. It's the truth. Because when you know who God is, when you know what God is capable of, when God has revealed himself to you just to sin against him, I mean, let's rephrase it like this. If you guys walked outside and saw the biggest, baddest bandito in the world, would you walk up to him and slap, it, slap him in the face? Would anybody do that? You'd have to be outright stupid to do that. Why? Because he's a bandito, first of all. That's the first sign. Big and bad, that, we can deal with that. But the fact that he's a bandito says something, right? We all know what the banditos are, correct? I feel like they're well enough known amongst the Southwest that we all know who they are. Their reputation precedes them. Don't mess with them. If a bandito wants to cut over in your lane, you let him in their lane. Just don't mess with them. Leave them alone. How much bigger is God? You would not slap that man because of his reputation, but the reputation of God is so much greater. And so when we willingly sin against God, which we're all guilty of, myself included, it's a stemming of nothing more than we get comfortable and we learn to not fear him as much. And that's a fear in becoming comfortable walking with the Lord. We wanna be careful how comfortable we get. We want to always make sure we're comfortable enough so that we're walking in the joy and in the love of God, but not so comfortable that we start thinking we can step on his toes, so to speak, like the Corinthians are doing. Because like that credit card, payment's coming. The, 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 the bill's going to be due, and God is going to require that payment. Again, in verse 1, it says, It is actually reported that there's immorality among you, and immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife. Now, notice what he just said there. He didn't say someone had his father's wife. What did he say? It's present tense. In the Greek, it's present active participle, I believe. Present active infinitive, which means it's a continuing case even as Paul is writing. As he's writing this, he's saying this dude is still with his dad's wife. <clears throat> how, how nuts is that? Verse 2, I think it even gets worse if you can believe that. He says, you have become arrogant. <laughs> you have become arrogant. Again, the Greek word is phusio, and it means to be lifted up. You're proud. You guys are proud that you've allowed this into your body. Again, there's a real danger in the church today where we feel like we have to be tolerant of sin. That if we're going to be loving, we have to just be tolerant. I'm here to tell you, sin is not tolerated. We're going to love the sinner. If you're in sin, we're going to love you. We're going to help you. We're going to help you walk. We're not going to tolerate the sin. And I think there's a very, very big difference. Now, Paul doesn't say that it's because of their tolerance. He just says, you guys have become arrogant. You guys have become proud. You're lifted up about what's taking place. So that leads us to the conclusion. It's, it would I would imagine it's the tolerance that they're allowing in and they're proud that they're so free in their Christianity that they just allow it. Again, with that note, that's an issue that the church faces today and it's a detrimental thing that we face. One of the issues I think with sin especially within, just within people in general, is in our day and age, and if it's always been like this, I've never noticed it, but as I was studying this, I was talking about, about this. We have learned to equate who we are with what we do. If I asked some of you guys, who are you? You'd say something like, I am a mechanic. I am a rapper. I am a musician. I am a clerk at the gas station. I pick it. And oftentimes, that's how people view who they are associated with what they do. Who are you? I am 
a homosexual. I am an adult. I mean, they wouldn't say an adulterer, but today homosexuality is being praised, so people are proud to say that's who they are. It's not who they are. It's what they do. And I think that's one of the issues that we're having in the church today, distinguishing the sin from the sinner. And we just kind of lump people up and, uh, don't you know who that person is? Rather than trying to be compassionate and understanding of maybe why they're there, they're not accepting it. But you do you realize that if we can understand people and why they are where they are, they'll be, they're open to allowing you in. It's the craziest thing. When drug addicts come in, when drunks come in, when homosexuals come in, when adulterers come in, when if you, you can pick any sin you want, there's a reason that person is doing what they're doing. Of course, when we're sinning, there's no logical reason. As far as there's no righteous reason, I should say. But you'd be surprised if you talk to them, it might make sense why that person is the way they are. Does it make it okay? It just makes sense. When I talk to drug addicts, I get why they're at where they're at. I, I get it. They're still wrong. But the fact that I'm willing to let them know I understand why you are there because I was there, I get it. You all, all of a sudden, you built a bond. You built a trust. Now they're willing to open up. Now they're willing to actually hear what you have to say. It's the craziest thing. You shut them out, they shut you out. Everything you say after you shut them out means nothing. They don't hear anything after that. Big problem in the church is equating people, their personhood, to their occupation, lifestyle, or anything of that nature. Today when homosexuals speak about the church, typically they say things like, you guys hate us because I'm gay. Ever heard that one? I've heard it. I don't hate anybody. I may not like what you do, but I don't hate anybody. But why can't you just accept me? Well, why can't you just accept Jesus? I, I accept you. I accept the way you come. I just don't agree with what you're doing. It's fine. If you're a gangbanger, the same rules apply to you. If you're living in adultery, the same rules apply to you. If you're a drunk, the same rules apply to you. If you're a blasphemer, the same rules apply to you. If you're a liar, the same rules apply to you. If you're a murderer, if you, you kind of get the drift, right? Sin must be dealt with accordingly. Now, I want to mention something because of that. What happens when a brand new person comes in, they give their life to Jesus for the first time, but they like smoking weed and they still drink and they're still partying and they just, they're little toddlers potting their pants. Do we jump on them and strangle that out of them? This is what I do. You don't have to like it. I don't care if you like it. This is what I do. Somebody comes in and they start coming and they show up and they're obviously up to no good. I'm going to leave them alone. And I'm going to thank them that they keep showing up. And I'm going to trust that God is going to do what he does with his word. What does the Bible tell us that the word itself does? It says it cuts. Deeper than bone and marrow, deeper than soul and spirit. It splits it all in half. The, by the word of God washes, is what my Bible tells me. The word of God transforms, is what my Bible tells me. The word of God is the power of salvation unto those who believe, is what my Bible tells me. When somebody comes in off the streets and they're living in sin, my job isn't to make them clean. Again, that's an area where the church is, where we're wrong. Our job isn't to clean people. It's not your job. It's not my job. Our job is to love people and share the gospel with them and teach them the word of God. And yes, there are going to be times where rebuke is going to be necessary, but it's not my job to clean any one of you. It's not even my job to clean my wife. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us he's the sanctifier. Not me. If I was your sanctifier, you'd all be in big trouble. Yeah, aren't you glad I'm not your sanctifier? Right? Because I'll whip you all into shape real quick. But aren't you glad it's the Holy Spirit who does it lovingly and kindly? I've told you guys this a million times. When I came to Christ for the first year and a half as a Christian, I smoked weed and dealt drugs and I was still gangbanging. And you might say, well, how could you have done that and been a believer? Because God wasn't dealing with those issues in my life at the time. God was dealing with things like, hey, Walter, love me. Just show up in fellowship. And it was the craziest thing. The more I showed up, the more I read the Bible, the more I wanted to not be that person anymore. And had anybody from the church I was at came at me wrong, I probably would have left. 
I'm just saying. And it's just the craziest thing when the Spirit of God does what He does, it works. 100% of the time. When we interfere and play Holy Spirit, we typically mess stuff up and make God's job harder. So when a new Christian comes in, I'm going to encourage you guys, or a person comes in and they're new to the faith, love them. If they ask you, hey, is smoking weed wrong? That's a, that's a funky one right now because, I mean, I'm not for it, but I'm not against it. You know, my dad smokes weed. He's, he has a broken, what is it, T3, and he has screws all up and down his spine, and he's all messed up, and he's in constant pain. It's pills or weed. If he does pills all day, he's all zonked out like a heroin addict. If he smokes weed, he's functional, but he can deal with the pain. If it's medicinal, I believe the Bible tells us in Genesis, God created everything and it was all good. If things become bad, when we distort them. So if you like to smoke weed because you like to be high, then we're going to tell them, yeah, that's bad. Well, why is it bad? It's natural. Yeah, but you don't do it for purposes that are medicinal. You like to be high. The Bible also says not to be, you know, to be sober. And so if you're high, you're not sober. You're high. So if they ask, we're going to be honest with them, but we're going to love them. Now, what about, let's say Don. Don walks in and Don's all messed up. Don is a veteran in the faith. So I'm going to rebuke Don if he walks in drunk. Or let's say I walked in drunk, all stupid, being your pastor. You ought to rebuke the living daylights out of me for that. Because I'm no longer a baby. I'm, I've, I've matured to some degree. And so we want to make sure we see those fine lines and we tread them very carefully, looking at ourselves first and foremost, making sure that we don't cross lines. Remember, we just went through the book of Galatians. That's what Paul talked about. He's in verse, what is it, chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Look at you first before you dare approach anybody else. Approach with trepidation. Make sure you approach in love. And that's it, you know. So I want to make sure we understand that. Verse 2, he says, You have become arrogant and have not mourned instead, so that the one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. He says, rather than mourning about what is taking place, about, about this man being with his father's wife, you guys have acted haughty, you've acted arrogant, you've, you've, you're walking in a pride, and that's disgusting before God. Mourning would have been the proper response. Now, I want to mention this because I feel like this is an important little thing to mention here, so I wrote it down. Unrepentance for what we know to be sin is called rebellion. I'm going to say that again unrepentance for what we know to be sin. It's more than just sin, it is rebellion. What is rebellion? It's knowingly and willingly going against God's ordinance. You've rebelled against, you've pulled the Satan, you've pulled the devil. I've, when once I've done that, we've pulled that. We are now acting just like the devil. Because is that not what he did? He rebelled against God. Such an attitude must be addressed. And when it's addressed, so let, let's say we have that happen here, right? Let's say somebody comes in and we find out this person's been sleeping with their father's wife. It's not his mom, father's wife, doesn't make a difference. The Bible says that's a big no-no. What do we do? How do we approach something like that? Well, we definitely approach that and that's a no-no. And we tell them, you don't do that. Well, what happens if they decide, well, I'm gonna keep doing it. Well, then we approach them with more witnesses and try to reason with them and talk sense to them. What happens if they decide, well, I just can't stop? Continued rebellion is call for removal. That's harsh, right? You throw them out of the church. If they refuse to repent, you put them out. Well, I thought you Christians are supposed to be loving. We are loving. It's why we approach them several times to begin with. We try to reason with them logically and bring them to, to, to what we're doing. What they're doing is wrong. We don't, we don't want them to continue in that because that's doing nothing but damage to them, to their dad, to the wife, to the marriage, to, to the surrounding family. It does nothing but damage. We are loving them by telling them to stop it. And if they refuse to stop it, we put them out. Now, you might be saying something in your mind like, Jesus would never do that. Well, I'm glad you said that. Because if we're going to make a quick turn to the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew is the first gospel. It's the first book in the New Testament. Turn to Matthew chapter 18. Let's see what Jesus has to say about rebellion in the church, in his church. 
since, you know, he's the head honcho, you know, what he says goes. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. Jesus speaking says, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault. It's approaching them and it's, hey, this is, we, see, we see you doing this. You really ought to stop. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. If he does not listen to you, take one or two or more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses even to listen to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. In essence, what he's saying is, if they still refuse to listen, throw them out. It's crazy. That's Jesus, right? That's his prescription for rebellion in the church. Now, the key here is we approach lovingly. We approach lovingly with witnesses. We approach lovingly as the body, uh, collectively. And if they refuse, then they're out. I think that's a fair role. I hope I never have to do something like that because that sounds horrible. But there's a reason that is done. Let's see why it's done. Let's move forward. In verse 3, he says, For I and my part, though absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this as though I were present. Now, before we get to the benefit of throwing him out, we're going to cover what Paul just said because he's going to say a couple things that I do want to address. He mentioned the word judging. Now, one of the first things that people who have an issue with Christianity, people who have an issue with Jesus, people who have an issue with the Bible or any, you know, it's Bible thumpers and hoppers and whatever, is they say things like this, judge not. It's as everybody's, you know, that's their programmed response. Shut up. Straight up, shut up. I said this, I believe, last week. The person who, is, who does not judge is a stupid human being. Well, that's a harsh thing to say. It's the truth. We talked about common judgments, right? Watch this one. When your kids, how old's your daughter? Four. Four. Perfect age. You got a four-year-old, right? When there's a hot stove, what do you tell your daughter? Why? Why? Your daughter, I can imagine her saying, how dare you judge me? I want to touch that stove. And I mean, that's probably how kids think because what's the first thing they go do? They go to touch the stove. It's the rebellion in the human nature. That's the rebellious nature, right? That's, that's how we're built. That's why God is undoing what we've put into us, that sin nature. But that's a judgment there. You're making a call. You're distinguishing a good thing and a bad thing. The good thing is, don't touch the stove. Why? Because if you touch it, a bad thing is going to happen. Well, what's going to happen? You're going to burn yourself. Well, I don't believe you. Psst. Ah! Now, that's usually how it works out. So when the Bible tells us to do and not to do things, that's the hot stove. Don't touch the hot stove. Hot stove is bad for your hand. Do you like using your hands? Then don't touch the stove. The judgment calls that we make daily. Here's one. You're pulling up to a light and it's red. You now you have a judgment to make. Do you run through the red light or do you stop? Because nothing's stopping you from running through it, right? All you got to do is press the gas. That's it. I see people do it all the time. If, you, if you're going to use wise judgment, sound judgment, you're going to press your brake. Why? Because you know that because it's red on my side, it's green on these other guys' sides, which means these cars are free to come and go. And if I decide I'm going to take this, I might get T-boned. And not the good kind of T-boned, the bad kind. <laughs> right? Judging. Now, I've said this. A number of times I'm going to say it again. The Greek word for judging is krino. K-R-I-N-O. There's two meanings to this word in its original form. And the way you distinguish which sentence that word is placed in and how it's used is by the surrounding context. To judge means to condemn. Krino, to condemn. To, to, to deliver the sentence of somebody going to hell. That's one way it's used. Well, how do we know when that verse is used? If we were to go to John 3.16, everybody knows that verse, right? Almost nobody knows the next verse over, John 
He says, For I have judged the world, because they have not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Because those who have not believed, they're judged already. That's the condemnation judging. That's that judge that's eternal. That's the judge that when people say, judge not lest you be judged, that's, well, that's, that's the one we don't play with. Condemnation is for God alone. We don't have the right to condemn. You don't have the right to tell anybody they're going to hell. Because you don't know if they're going to repent. You don't know what God's doing. We don't have the right to tell anybody they're going to hell. If we ever tell somebody they're going to hell, you were wrong. I'm just letting you know. You don't have that right. That, that is solely God's and His alone. Now the judging that the Bible tells us, it commands us to do, is the second part of what that word means. So krino means to condemn. Krino also means to distinguish between good and evil. Good and bad. Righteous and unrighteous. Those are the, that's the krino that we use on a daily basis, right? Pretty girl starts flirting with you. Now you gotta make a judgment. Do you flirt with evil or do you go the righteous route and walk away? Hopefully you walk the other way. But the point is we use judgments every day. And when I see a brother or sister doing something that's going to harm themselves and the people around them, it's a righteous thing to go and say, hey, look, I see what you're doing. You shouldn't be doing that. Don't judge me. I should judge you. The Bible says I should judge you. Paul here says, on my part, though absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged him who has committed this. Paul saying, I've already distinguished this. There's nothing further to hear. Sleeping with his dad's wife, yep, get him out. There's nothing, there's no deliberation that needs to be heard. It's what's, I've heard all that needs to be heard, that's it. Verse 4, he says, In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled, and I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, I really, really enjoyed studying this little part here. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But I really enjoyed this. Because he says, in the name of our Lord Jesus, I come in this power. Now, what is he referring to? I believe what Paul is referring to is what was spoken in Matthew 18, verses 15 to 17. He jumped right back to the source of what Jesus said. So he said, Jesus commanded this to be done. And in the power of what Jesus said, I come in that authority. And I say, remove the dude. He says that, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, Paul makes reference to Satan as the God of this world. Don't think capital G, think little g. God is another term for ruler. So he is, Satan rules this world as of now. I mean, obviously God is still chief in command, commander in chief, however you want to say it. He's still the big dog, so to speak. But God has allowed Satan a certain amount of authority on this world. He has. Just look around. Look what's going on. We shouldn't be too shocked about that. But what's shocking about what Paul is saying is, he says, for this unrepentant Christian, he says, I have decided to deliver him over to Satan. What does he mean when he says he's decided to deliver him over to Satan? What he's saying is, remove him from the church and thereby delivering him into the world. The world that the enemy runs as of now. For the destruction of his flesh. Now, I read a number of commentaries and they split in two different routes. One says the destruction of the flesh is the literal death of this person. He's going to die. We're going to put him out the church and he's going to die. But since he's a believer, remember, what is it, like three or four weeks ago, we talked about being on the rock. And if we're born again, if we're on the rock, you're saved. And anything we build on, depending on what we build, is going to burn in the fire or it's not going to burn. He talks about the stones, the precious stones, the gold and the silver. Then he talks about the wood, hay and stubble. And those are, are what we build on our faith. So what this could mean is you put him out of the church and he's going to physically die, but he'll be saved because he's still a believer. Could mean that. I don't think that's what that means. Because the goal in church discipline isn't that the person die. 
The goal in church discipline is that restoration take place. Realize restoration is always the goal. I mean, even the death, we're, we're celebrating Resurrection Sunday, the resurrecting of Christ. What did he die and resurrect for? To restore. Everything Jesus did was about restoration. We're going to start the book of Revelation on Thursday, and we're going to see everything Jesus has done and is going to do. It's all about restoration. To restore a fallen humanity to himself. To restore the fallen world that humanity plummeted into the chaos that we see today. Jesus is going to restore. And the church, our goal in any kind of discipline is restoration. As a father, when I have to deal with my kids, the goal isn't to whoop the living daylights out of them and nah, set that fear in them. The goal is to restore them. From what? To restore them from their rebellious little attitude and actions back into a regular kid. That's the beauty of a whooping. It brings quick restoration. <laughs> and, you know, this is a spiritual spanking. A physical, really, it's a physical spanking. Putting them out of the church would be, that's one of the ways that, is, that discipline brings that restoration about. We're not going to go into 2 Corinthians after we finish 1 Corinthians in probably like a year or so. But if we were to go in, we'd see in, I think it's chapter 4 or 5, maybe 3. It's in 2 Corinthians where Paul talks to the Corinthians about, hey, look, if the dude is repented, let him back in. Many believe he's talking about this guy because the Corinthians take heart to what Paul's going to say and they're going to throw this dude out the church and we're going to find we believe that he repented. And so the goal isn't this physical death and damnation on this person. The goal is that the guy be put out to be restored. Now, as a believer, has, has anybody ever participated in worldly events? Going out and getting smashed or flirting with sin or however, you know, whatever it is. Isn't it the craziest thing when you know God? When you truly know Jesus? You can't ever really live in the world. You can't. Because there's this little ticking in your head of the Holy Spirit poking you, letting you know you're messing up. And when you're playing footsie with the world and trying to walk with Jesus, you can never really enjoy fellowship with the church or even with the Lord because there's this little ticking in your head knowing what you were just doing. And it's the most miserable place to be when you're a believer thrown into the world. It's just one of the most miserable things I imagine ever. There's no contentment. There's no peace. You're destitute of it all. You're just in your own dross and disgustingness. But it's a beautiful thing because it brings about a sorrow that brings repentance. That's a great thing. He says he has decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, to put him out into the world for the destruction of his flesh, the spiritual flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Again, when somebody's put out, if they never come back, then that begs the question, were they ever really saved? The answer would probably be no. If they come back, then their spirit it shows that they always were in the faith. That's a biggie. Verse 6, he says, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Leaven. In Scripture, leaven is a type of sin. Why is it a type of sin? Because like sin, leaven permeates and it spreads. So what, what, what Paul's referencing here is it's an old classic illustration. You know, we remember it from the Passover. It's in the story, you remove the leaven from the house, from the bread, you know, during the feasts. Leaven was, it's a, what is it? It's leaven is what it is. I can't think of what the, what the actual name is. A yeast, thank you. And what it does is you put it inside the dough. You, you know, let's just say we yeasted up some dough. What would be the point of yeasting up the dough, leavening the dough? So it could rise. When you bake it, it rises. If you don't have any kind of yeast in there, it just, it's a pancake. Or a cracker, you know, just, that's it. So what would take place in ancient times is you'd pluck off a piece of that yeasted bread and save it. You'd put it away for the next batch. And then you'd cook your dough. 
And when you're getting ready to cook again or bake, you take that piece of leavened dough and mix it in with the new dough. And what does it do? It spreads throughout. That's why it's a picture of sin, because sin is exactly like that. We think sin is simply relegated to just us. As long as I'm the only one doing it, I'm not involving anybody, nobody will get hurt. But that's never true. When we sin, it permeates to everyone around us. When we live in sin, we produce what's called bad fruit. Now, one thing that I've learned about fruit is you don't eat your own fruit. The people around you do. You want to know if you have good or bad fruit? Look at the people around you. That'll tell you everything you need to know about yourself. It's like you've heard the saying, you want to know how a, you want to know how a husband is doing? Look at the wife. You want to know how a Christian is doing? Look at the people around him. When we produce bad fruit, we see it taints the people around us. Have you ever met one of those Christians who seem strong? Man, they're like hardcore Christians and everything about them seems legit. Except every time they're in any kind of a group or anything, it goes south. You guys ever notice that? I have. I've known a lot of people like that. And sorry, let me get this back going. My video cut out. That's what it is. But have you guys ever noticed that? I have. I, I'm not going to mention this person by name, but there was this person who used to, uh, I want to make sure I say it so nobody knows who she is. I shouldn't have said she. <laughs> but basically, she would get in these groups with people, right? She would just start hanging around people. And all of a sudden, they'd all become divided. They'd start talking garbage about other people. and It just got weird. And then she'd move from this group and she'd go start hanging out with this set of people. And then all of a sudden, and, and, and mind you, these were all believers that were strong believers. And then all of a sudden, everybody in this group started getting weird with each other, started talking garbage about other people in the church. And then she would move and go to another group. And I noticed that actually I had to go talk about this to some of the pastors and let them know, hey, like, this is going on. She went to this other group, and now she's in this group. And every group she would be a part of, you know, we all have our little groups after church. We like to hang out with certain people. The people she always hung around with, no matter where she went, ended up divided. It was the weirdest thing. But you talk to her, and she can quote scripture up and down. She knows the Bible. She has the Christian lingo. She speaks Christianese very well. Knows all the right things to say. Bad fruit. Some events happened in her life that showed how bad her fruit was. Because you know how that credit card bill always comes in? Bad fruit. Don't ask why I'm talking about, oh, because 11, you know, sin doesn't just affect you. You like to think it does. We like to think it does. If you're married, it affects your wife or your husband. If you've got kids, it affects them. you got friends, it affects them. It affects everything you touch. Take the old leaven out, Paul's going to say here in a second. He says, Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Because of that, you're boasting, it's not good. Verse 7, clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. Again, leaven being a picture of sin, why are we unleavened? Because Christ bore our sin on his own back, on the cross. The leaven was removed, so to speak. We no longer have to live in sin. Now, will you sin? We are sinners. You're going to sin. That's, that's, we're sinners. But you no longer have to live in sin. There's a difference. And when we live in sin, we live in a state of leavenness, so to speak. You don't have to live like that anymore. None of us do. You can choose to. But again, at the cost of what? So don't think I'm saying you're going to be sinless. There's only one sinless, that's Jesus. If we could ever be sinless, then the cross was unnecessary. Again, Paul went through that in Galatians at nausea. We went in depth about that. You will sin, but you don't have to live in sin. Remember what sin is. Let's just take a quick reminder. Sinning is missing the mark, right? It comes from archery. You pull your arrow back and you aim right at that bullseye with you, and you missed. You hit somewhere else on that target. But you didn't hit the bullseye. You missed the mark. That's sin. Transgression 
is a little bit different. Transgression is pull back, I point to that bullseye, and then I miss on purpose. I, I tilt to the left as I pull my, as I let go of the, the bowstring. I missed it on purpose. It's called transgression. So we're all going to sin. We all miss the mark. But we no longer have to live in sin, which would be a form of transgression, a form of willingly sinning, a form of rebellion is what it is. Prior to Christ, we were rebellious by nature. It's what we were. In Christ, we no longer live in rebellion, but rather in obedience. Hopefully we know the difference. The difference is. So he says, In fact, you are unleavened, for Christ our Passover has also been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. It says, Christ is our Passover. I love that because we just celebrated Passover, I think it was last week. It was actual Passover for the Jews. And then as Christians today, we celebrate, this would be like the Passover weekend, you know, the, the whole Resurrection Sunday, you know, that Friday or Thursday or Wednesday, whenever Jesus was crucified. That's a teaching we did last year in Mark. Oh, and at depth in that, well, we don't believe Jesus was really crucified on a Friday. That just doesn't fit the biblical calendar. But not the point. The point was Jesus is our Passover. Now, why did Paul say that? What was the purpose of the Passover? What was it all about? Well, it goes back to the book of Exodus when God set the Jews free from the land of Egypt. Egypt, not Egypt, Egypt. And what God was going to do is he was going to judge Egypt, which was a type of the world, is a type of the world still in the Bible. And he was going to judge them with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm so that they would let his children go because they were in bondage in the world. It's a picture of us, humanity being bound to the world, to the fleshly desires. God is going to judge the world in order to set his children free. God did that. On the cross, thou call that a prejudgment. Because the, 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 the big judgment to the world is coming, we call that the tribulation. But this prejudgment, so to speak, is where Jesus bore the judgment of the world on his body for those who put their faith in him. So we remember in the book of Exodus when the Passover takes place and God's about to send the death angel throughout the land and he's going to take the firstborn. He tells them, I want you to put the blood of a lamb on the lintels and the doorposts of your houses. And if that blood is there, judgment will pass over your house to the next house that doesn't have blood. That's why it's Passover. Christ became our Passover when he died for our sins on the cross. The second we put our faith in him, his blood covered us. And the judgment of God now passes over us. The thing about Passover is there were some strict commands. During Passover week, to this day, the Jews still do it, especially if, if they're, what's the word I'm looking for when they're hardcore Jews? Um, still have the little curls and the, no, not rabbis. Um, no, not. <laughs> as good. Conservative Jews. Nah, conserv I'm going to use the word conservative Jews. The, Jews. the Jews that are really hardcore into their faith. They still do it to this day. During Passover, right as Passover is coming up, they remove all the leaven from the house because that was the command from God. Get all the leaven out. No leaven must be found in your house at all. None. They even play little games with the kids. They hide leaven around the house and the kids have to go around and find the leaven and we've got to remove the leaven. If we're believers in Christ, remove the leaven from the house because our judgment has been passed over. We no longer live in rebellion. Remove the leaven. I love what Paul says here. He, he, he equates the leaven. He says, remove the leaven. Or Therefore, let us celebrate the feast in verse 8. Not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness. Now that is the picture right there. That is the whole idea of leaven, the sin. It's more than just missing the mark. It's malice. It's wickedness. Remove that from our lives. You ever, there's an old song. What is it? The wicked don't sleep. No, how is it goes? Does anybody remember how that song goes? Ain't no rest for the wicked. Ain't no rest. Something like that. That's biblical. That's actually in Isaiah. There is no rest for the wicked. For those who have leaven-filled lives, you will never know rest. You'll never know rest. 
remove the leaven, experience the joy of God, the joy that Jesus brings. Well, I think Christianity is corny. I think going to hell is corny. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, there's nothing corny about Christianity. There's corny, what's corny about living in peace? What's corny about actually enjoying life? What's corny about having real life? I can remember before I was a Christian, anybody in here that, 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 that has a strong walk knows this. What was life before you knew Jesus? Would you want to go back to that? I, can't think, I don't know anybody who would ever go back to it. Because if they did, they would already be there. I mean, when, when you come to know true life, it's amazing. I remember when smartphones first came out. I hated them. I got like the first smartphone that ever came out from Verizon. And I was going to throw it out my window when I was so mad because I couldn't figure it out. I went from a flip phone to a smartphone. And I, I was riding with my boy Ramon and we're somewhere like on 4th Street. I don't remember. But I was trying to do something and I throw it out the window and he stopped me. He's like, bro, chill out. I'm like, I hate this phone, bro. I want my old phone back. He's like, that phone was designed to make your life easier. You just got to figure out how to use it. I'm here to tell you, when I figured out how to use the phone to its purposes and abilities, it's an incredible device. We were created to be used and to be a certain way. And when we submit to Jesus, what we were created to be and do flourishes in us. And when you do what you were created to do, all of a sudden, you experience true life. Like that phone became something great in my hand, life becomes something great in the hands of Jesus. Because you're now operating the way you were meant to be operated. Walking outside of Christ, you're just all dysfunctional. Because you, we weren't meant to walk apart from Him. Don't be dysfunctional. Let Jesus in. In verse 9, he says, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. Here, we're going to see that the Corinthian church made a grave mistake that the church today makes often. He says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. The fact that he said that, you guys, I wrote to you in my letter before. Remember, we talked about it in the opening. This is at least Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. So for sure, we have a missing letter somewhere. Where it's at, nobody knows. It doesn't matter because if God saw it fit to be here, it would be here. But he says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. The church is good at that. The church is so good at not associating with people who aren't like us. We're great at it. We just, we overlook the world. We overlook people because they're sinners. And then we overlook the sin that's running rampant in our own body. Hypocrites. That's what we are. Today, the church, by and far, not all of us, but by and far, the church is filled with hypocrites. We sneer and we lift our noses at those who don't believe. Then we overlook the adultery taking place within the body. We overlook the drug abuse that's taking place in the body. And we write it off with grace. Paul says, I told you not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world. Oh, we got that one wrong, didn't we? Just like the Corinthians, we got that wrong. We don't shut out the world. We invite them in. We go out and we minister to them. Yeah, but he's a drug addict. All the more to go reach him. Yeah, but she's a prostitute. All the more to reach her. Yeah, but all the more to reach them. He says, I did not at all mean with the immoral people of... I did not all, at all mean with the immoral people of this world or with the covetous and swindlers or with idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. Paul saying, dude, if you guys didn't associate with any sinners, you guys wouldn't even be allowed. Where would you go? What do you do when you need gas or groceries or the bank or... We have to associate with the world. That's fine. We're not like the world. We're not of the world but we associate with the world, it's okay. It's okay to talk to people who are in sin. It's totally, it's a great thing. Actually, I would say, use that as a time to be a witness. Use that as a time to open a door. Who knows what God might do? 
I mean, that's how all of us came to Christ at some point, I assume, right? Somebody talked to us while we were in our filth. Maybe we could extend that same courtesy and not be like the rest of the American church. I don't like being associated with the American. I, I can't stand the American church. I think we're just disgusting. We're just like the Corinthian church. We got all the biblical values wrong. So much, so much of the church today has the Bible wrong. They have Jesus wrong. The church today thinks if Jesus showed up on the scene, he'd come here and he'd sit somewhere up here, maybe even teach for us. That's what the Jews thought. But where was Jesus doing his teachings? In the marketplace, on the corner, in the field, with all the people that were considered sinners. If Jesus came today, he wouldn't go to the churches, I tell you that much. He'd be on the corner of St. Michael's and Cerrios. Right? The church needs to get our act together is what we need to do. Because we're messing up. By and far, I said, not everybody. I'm not saying it's every person, but I'm just saying by and far, the church. We're messing up, man. The craziest thing, it's right here written for us. I don't know how we miss this. Actually, I do. It's because people don't teach the Bible. You don't teach the Bible, you don't learn the Bible. You don't learn the Bible. How are you supposed to operate as a Christian? You can't. It's the whole building with hay, wood, and stubble. It says in verse 11, but, I, but actually I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. So he says, hey, if they're not Christians and they act like this, cool. Talk to them. Love on them. Associate with them. It's fine. He says, but if, they're a, if they call themselves a Christian and they act like this, again, we reprove them in love. We talk to them first. Let's get them walking if they don't know how to walk yet. Let's get them mature. Once they're mature, if they refuse to repent and they want to live in rebellion, Paul says, cut the tie. You don't talk to them. He says, don't even associate with them. He says, don't even eat with them. Now, in Paul's day, eating was a big deal. It was no small thing. It was a very, it was a very intimate thing to eat with somebody. I know in the Middle East, a lot of the mindset of eating with somebody was you become one with them when you eat, in a spiritual sense. As you guys partake of the same sustenance, you eat from the same bowls and the same platters, and you guys, in a, in a, in a real sense, become one. It's a very intimate thing in the East to eat. Even to this day, in some parts of the Middle East, for somebody to invite you into their home to eat is a huge deal. It's no small thing. So Paul says, don't even eat with them. Because by doing so, you're fellowshipping in what they're doing. It's, it's like saying you heartily agree. Paul says no. I believe that's part of the church discipline is when we cut those ties and we say no. You guys, we're going to cut this tie. You're not welcome back to you. Repent. Again, key is restoration. We want repentance. Be restored. But if restoration isn't taking place, if they're not repenting, then... You cut the tie until, you know, until they've had enough. That's all there is to say about that. Verse 12, For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church? But those who are outside, God judges. So back to what I said earlier. When we see people living in sin that aren't Christians, don't call them out. That's just arrogance. Don't be that Christian. I used to be that Christian. That's why I'm telling you, don't be that Christian. When the world acts like the world, don't be shocked. Everybody's freaking out about that one, who that one black rapper dude, who's, he's like gay and put out those Satan shoes. The church is in a fit right now. I'm just sitting there like, well, what do you expect? You're shocked? I'm not. Now, if he was a Christian, I would be shocked. I would be like, what? Did you know that he had, I guess he put out a tweet that said he was curious to see how the church was going to respond to this? I'm here to tell you the church did exactly what he thought the church was going to do. Shame on us. We did exactly what he thought we were going to do. Guy's an idiot. He doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't know anything about Satan for real. He's just doing show. He's just... When the world acts like the world, don't be surprised. Love them. 
I would wish I could talk to the dude. I'd be like, well, what inspired you to do this? Mom, I hating it. Where was it? Who, who was it? I think Pastor Gil was with me. We were up there by uh, what, De Vargas Park? No. Where, where's the, the employment? Is De Vargas? We're right there at De Vargas Park, and I, I walk up to this native dude, and I want to tell him about Jesus. It's one of those days where we're doing the uh, outreach. First thing he says to me, I'm a Satanist. And then he pulls out his star. I said, cool. I said, good for you, man, right on. It's like, why? What, what, what made you want to worship Satan? I mean, he just he said everything you could think of to get me to you know, budge. I'm not going to budge. Like, you want to worship Satan? That's on you. Like, cool. Not cool, but you know what I mean? Like, okay. So after about five, ten minutes of talking with the dude, he starts crying and says, I'm a Christian. But I've been hurt by the church. Oh, go figure. I'm sorry, I really don't, I don't believe in saying, I just use that to, when people try to talk to me. And he ended up praying for me. <laughs> he was like, dude was just in a bad spot. He was, you know, on the streets doing no good. And craziest thing, right? If we just stopped to, instead of, I could have just judged him. I could have up and down and... Let him have some of that Holy Spirit fire. Nothing would have happened in him. Nothing would have changed. But rather than sitting here giving him the finger and not the middle finger, just the index, you know, but you know, sticking my finger in his face and giving him a piece of my mind because I'm a Christian. Talk to the dude. Don't be shocked when the world acts like the world. Don't judge them. Don't condemn them. When the church acts like the world, okay. If your daughter is messing up, that's your business. If she's throwing a fit in here, I'm not her mom or her dad. It's your job to deal with that. When my sons are messing up, that's my job to deal with that. It's nobody else's job. Now, I've given you guys all free range. If any of them acts up, smack them. You're free. I'm, I'm old school. I mean, you can, to, to a degree, you know, but when it comes to when they really need to be disciplined, that's my job, and I'm going to take care of business. The church is ours. When the church acts up, we deal with the church. When the world acts up, they're not ours. They're of a different thing. Paul says here, God is the one who judges the church. Again, I'm going to read verse 12 one more time. He says, For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do not judge those, do you not judge those who are within the church? Verse 13. But those who are outside, God judges. Remove the wicked man from among yourselves. Again, Paul wraps it up, telling them, stop pointing the finger at, you know, again, in their spirituality, the Corinthian thing, uh, pointed the Corinthians pointed their fingers at the unbelieving church, at the unbelieving people. They weren't the church. At those who didn't think like them, dress like them, act like them, at those who didn't meet their standards. They were judgmental and, and, and sinister towards those people. And for the very people that were in their body acting like those outside, it was all grace, love, and tolerance. Backwards. For those in the church that are acting like the world, we reprimand them, we reprimand them, we reprimand them, continue rebellion, we remove them. To those outside the church, grace and love. Romans 4.4, 4, one of my favorite verses. For the kindness of God draws men to repentance. What draws men to repentance? What draws men to repentance? But what draws men to repentance? God's kindness draws men to repentance. Show the love of God to a dying, broken world, and people will come to Christ. Stick a finger in their face, and they'll stick one back in yours, but not the one you're thinking. I'm talking to you, they'll stick the middle finger in your face, or they'll punch you. You know, love the people in this world. We want to be harder on the church. Again, I tell my kids all the time, I'm hard on you guys because I love you guys. Because I don't want you to grow up and be spineless, you know, snowflakes walking around. You see all these kids today, and for lack of better words, they're wusses. That's what they are. They're weenies. They have no spine. It's true. I look at this generation that's coming up and I, I feel bad for them. I don't want these guys to be like that. I want them to grow up to be men. 
So why I'm hard on them, I tell them, you think you got it hard? Wait till Ezekiel gets older. I'm going to whip that kid into shape. I have him 24-7. You know, I only get them half the week. I don't want my son to be a, a chump. I want him to be a man, more importantly, a man of God. I want him to have values and not be able to be bent every which way. I want him to know what he believes and to stand on truth. That's what the church needs today. The church needs men of God to raise. Because right now we have a lack of men being men in the church. Don't ask why I'm on that tangent. I don't even know how I got there. But Paul tells them to remove the wicked man from among their midst, from among themselves. And that's what we ought to do. We're going to love people here. We have our, our little motto, and it's kind of like the one church in Albuquerque is, you know, most loved, best fed. And it's true. We're going to feed you guys physically and spiritually the best possible food we can give you. And we're going to love you guys unconditionally. But unconditional love doesn't mean we're going to tolerate your sin. Doesn't mean you guys should tolerate my sin. We're going to love each other by calling each other out. We're going to love each other by holding each other accountable. We're going to love each other by lifting each other up in prayer, lifting ourselves up in prayer. That's what we need to be doing, praying for one another. It's easy to judge. It's a lot harder to come alongside somebody and bear bear their burdens up with them. But is that not the command that Paul gave in Galatians 6, 1? Bear one another's burdens. That was a hard passage today, you guys. You guys came thought and you're going to get an Easter message and you guys got a big old chapter on immorality and it doesn't get easier. As we go forward, Paul has a lot he still needs to deal with concerning the Corinthian church. And as I've said from the very beginning, the Corinthian church and the American church mirror each other. I think this book is so relevant for what's taking place in America today. In our, in our churches, on our streets, and we need to change that. There are, there are things that need to change in the church. In the 60s and 70s, the Jesus movement happened and God did a miraculous thing. We need that again. Because even a lot of those churches that were once a part of the Jesus movement have drifted. And the church has gotten so out of whack. Our gears need to be oiled. Belts need to be replaced. New tires are needed. Maybe some new pistons. And we need to rebuild the engine on this faith because it's running like garbage right now. Father, we thank you for being God and for your faithfulness. Thank you that you are the everlasting God, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. We thank you, Jesus, that you died for our sins, that you took and bore our punishment on your back as you hung on that cross. We thank you that you rose again, validating your claim to Godship, validating that you are who you are, Lord. I pray, Lord, that if there's anybody here or there's anybody watching, if there's anybody that is convicted, Lord, and they feel like they need to just come back to you, that in their heart right now they would just ask you back in, that they would ask you to be the Lord of their lives or that they would surrender their will to you, Lord, that they would be yours and you would be theirs. I pray for anybody who has that in their hearts, that you would overflow them with your peace, Lord, and with your joy, that your grace would flood them that you would transform them, that you'd make them like you, Lord. We pray that as we go out this week, Lord, that we would represent you in an honorable way, Lord, that our words would be yours, our thoughts would be like yours, our actions would be like yours, that this world would know and see you in us, Jesus. Just thank you for being our God. Thank you for loving us and for dying for us. Would you keep us and cause your face to shine upon us as we go out this week? In Jesus' name.